Hi again, everyone. It's day two of consulting week here in cloudy Brooklyn. I again am AJ Ehrenstein, Dean of Beyond Barnard. Excited to do day two here and to dive into some of the nitty gritty when it comes to applying to consulting jobs using some best practices for putting together resumes and cover letters. Super excited to see those of you who accessed the consulting folder yesterday. I saw lots of new entries into the consulting case partner spreadsheet. So continue to definitely access uh, that. If you did not get a follow-up email from me last night, it means that you weren't originally registered for the event. Um, so I see some folks in the chat asking about the recording from yesterday. I will put it into the chat. Um, at the end of this program and then just make sure that you sign the sign in sheet um, and I'll make sure that it goes to the folks who signed in today. So um, without further ado, here we go. Consulting job documents, the second day of the annual Beyond Barnard Consulting and Case Club introduction to the consulting industry. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll be off and running. All right, so just a recap of what to expect this week. Yesterday, we did an introduction to the industry overall, talked a little bit about the history of consulting, talked a little bit about what consultants actually do for their living, talked about a little bit about the, uh, the kinds of alumni that I know of, that we some of us all know of uh, in the industry and some strategies for getting started and connecting with them. Today, we're gonna to talk job documents. Tomorrow, we'll talk behavioral interviews or coffee chats. Thursday, we'll talk about case interviews and we will round things off on Friday with a small panel of alumni consultants. So today, job document best practices. By the end of today, pretty straightforward goals. I hope that you'll be able to begin to write some strong resumes and cover letters to get you noticed as candidates I'll also just talk throughout about some resources at Beyond Barnard that can support your creation of strong documents. I see some familiar names on the, uh, in the, the kind of rundown of folks here today. So I know that some of y'all come to Beyond Barnard for these kinds of resources already. And I'm gonna to continue to encourage you all to take advantage of things like uh, our virtual resources, our appointments with staff and with peer career advisors. In terms of the agenda, how we'll do it, I'll start by talking about what kinds of candidates do firms want to hire. So basically trying to articulate some of the, uh, some of the traits that I see that consultants tend to have, some of the traits of candidates that tend to be successful in the hiring process. But really what I'll make an argument about is that you can really make your experience into the kind of experience that consultants want to see. I hope that you'll leave today feeling confident that no matter what your background is, and I'm talking there about your major, about your coursework, about your internship experiences, about your student leadership experiences, the challenge for you as a candidate will not be to be a totally different person, but instead to learn how to translate those experiences based on what consultants typically like to see. Then I'll dive very specifically into resume and cover letter best practices for consulting jobs, and round out with questions. Pretty straightforward agenda for this afternoon's presentation. This is my like bread and butter, y'all. This is like, I've been doing, doing this stuff for a long time. Resumes are perfect for a gloomy fall day. All right, so let's start off with what kinds of candidates do firms typically want to hire? I thought about three different ways to think about this question. I know it actually came up specifically yes, in yesterday's conversation and it got me to kind of turning on different ways to address this, this question of what kinds of folks. The, the most basic answer to share is that consultants really are a diverse group of people. I've seen consultants from all kinds of academic disciplines, all kinds of individual backgrounds, majors, uh, hometowns, uh, across class and race, of course, and gender. Um, but when it comes down to it, when thinking about the kind of work that people do, there's, there's a couple of different ways to think about um, reflecting on what kinds of candidates are attractive to firms. I wanted to start with a word about websites. So one way to think about it is the firms actually tell you. Way number one is listen to what the firms tell you about their, their practices. So this is a poll from BCG's website. Basically has a list of different people with lots of different kinds of backgrounds. 
Um, I like this site and others like it. Others definitely imitate it because it gives you profiles of people. And essentially what firms try to do when they're doing this is instill confidence that there are lots of different backgrounds represented at the company. A website is, as I put it here, the firm's front door. They should be putting their best foot forward. You should be interested in and able to find folks that look like you, that come from backgrounds like you, that maybe represent interests that you have, folks that maybe have interests totally different to you, but an expression of the firm's interest in candidates who bring what you bring to the table. At the same time, recall that firms want to be distinctive. And sometimes, as I think is happening here on BCG's website, they sacrifice clarity in their desire to be creative. So I don't know exactly what it is to be imagine, an imaginative seeker. I don't know what it means to be a dynamic ally versus a fearless ally. And I like that those two things are there, or a fearless seeker. I don't know necessarily what these terms mean. And so the, to extend the metaphor, perhaps beyond its breaking point, while a website is the firm's front door, you still want to check the faucets. That is, you still want to actually get inside the house and talk to the people that make the firm tick. Ask them, ask individuals, connect with alumni, connect with fellow students who are interns at firms, and ask them what kinds of candidates they see around them. I'll continue to echo this theme of networking and connection throughout the week. And as many of you know, who know me well, I talk about networking and building community across a lot of different ways of exploring opportunities. I wanted to also zoom in here though. Um, sometimes it is important to pay attention to what's on a firm's website when thinking about what kinds of candidates they want. The firm here, I, I'm going to allow to remain as anonymous as possible, but I zoomed out as much as I could. And uh, I think you'll notice pretty quickly here something about this particular firm's About Us page. This is a page labeled Leadership. And on a page of 3, 6, uh, 8, 11, 13, 16, 19, 21 senior leaders, and this is all of them. Uh, there's one thing that's notable, noticeable to me right away as, a, as an individual at Barnard is that there is not a single uh, individual who seems to, to represent as a, as a woman on that page. Um, when a firm tells you who they are, you should listen. Uh, in other words, if you are finding uh, that a firm is representing itself one way, but perhaps the people that represent that firm are telling a different story, you should understand what that means. Um, you should ask questions about it. You should determine if, let's say, an all-male leadership structure is actually an opportunity to break in and say, you know, I want to be a woman who comes into this firm. I identify as a woman, and I want to come to this firm and help you grow out uh, leadership capacities and pipelines for women at this firm. For some people who like to be the first, this is a great opportunity. For other kinds of people, noticing that there's no one that looks like you, there's no one that represents your background, and there doesn't seem to be interest in it is not the kind of firm culture that you want to pursue. It's important to ask yourself based on who you find at a firm, is that an opportunity for you? Is it not an opportunity for you? I'm always happy to have these conversations. I think that assessing what kinds of candidates are attractive to firms. Um, right now, it's important that you all recognize that diversity, equity, and inclusion are very important talking points in recruiting pitches for firms. It does not mean the diversity, equity, and inclusion are built into firm cultures right now. I'm not trying to call out anybody in particular, but I think it's important for Barnard students right now to be really cognizant of the difference between real commitment to these themes and, uh, you know, kind of lip service. That said, so the front door, the, the company website uh, is, is way number one. Way number two is uh, the way that I've talked about consulting candidates for a long time. So when, th when thinking about uh, your experience in terms of job documents, consulting firms essentially want candidates who show that they understand consulting work. We'll talk about how you convey this in job documents today. They also want candidates who show that they understand and can do consulting work. So, this is the tricky translating work that you might want to start thinking about how you can do. How is what you do in the leadership, um, and I see 
I see some familiar faces and names here. So I know that some of y'all are in leadership positions on campus. How is the role that you occupy currently actually potentially frameable as a consulting endeavor? How is it an opportunity for you to assess challenges, identify the sources of those challenges, suggest potential improvements or solutions, and then implement those solutions? How does your work on SGA or in a student organization or as an RA or as a teacher or a tutor, how do those roles not necessarily just constitute being an RA or teaching or tutoring? How do they get translated into assessing problems, analyzing potential solutions, articulating and presenting the worth of those solutions, and then implementing them for, to make improvements? In other words, when I say that consulting firms do like candidates who show that they understand and have already done consulting work, I don't mean that you need to have been a consultant already, because none of you has been a consultant. Maybe one of you or two of you have been a consulting intern, but none of you has been a full-time consultant. That is the kind of work that you are pursuing now for the first time. So the challenge before you is not to become a totally different candidate. The challenge before you is a rhetorical candidate. It's a rhetorical challenge to make an argument about how what you have done already is preparation for what you will do as a consultant. Or to those of you who may be in your first year or sophomore year and who don't have a ton of experience on campus and in internships and leadership organizations, how can you start thinking now about the how the things that you will be applying to and the things you will be doing could be framed as consulting work. It's about how you frame your experience, not necessarily about the experience itself. Keeping in mind I, my initial pitch here that consulting firms really do hire people from across backgrounds, that part's true. But what they don't hire is people who come from those different backgrounds and don't have the ability to translate those backgrounds to the particular work of consulting. Everybody that I know who's a consultant can tell you exactly why what they did in college has some resonance with what they're doing in their career. Even if your pitch is, I did something wildly different from consulting as an undergraduate student, but what it did was prepare me to think critically and analytically in X, Y, Z ways. And that in itself prepared me to be a consultant. I see that all the time. So way number three. So those are maybe two kind of, um, I don't know, I feel like the second way is a little bit more conceptual. So I wanna dig back into um, a couple more concrete things for you to take away. Consulting firms value evidence of certain attributes, and I think there are also a lot of myths out there about what you need to succeed in the recruiting process. I wanna go kind of go through both. So it is true that consulting firms value evidence of strong academic credentials. And I'll say this a lot when I'm advising students. I think that your academic work is interesting to consultants. Think back to our conversation yesterday. Consultants like to sell themselves on the interestingness and intellectual cha intellectually challenging nature of their work. Therefore, your intellectual work is often very interesting to consultants. I like putting selected coursework on a consulting resume. I like putting thesis topics on a consulting resume to convey some of the commitments that you're pursuing in a serious way at Barner. What you don't need as a consulting candidate is a 4.0 GPA, right? So not every candidate that's successful in pursuing consulting work has a perfect academic record, particularly at Barnard. Um, what you need is evidence that you have been a committed student, that you have done well. And that does not mean that you never got below an A plus at Barnard which is actually 4-3, crazily. Um, <clears throat> consulting firms value evidence of, ex uh, of having experience solving problems, but they don't necessarily need you to have three consulting internships solving problems at McKinsey. So when I say solving problems, I could mean conducting research in a collaborative environment in, summer, in a summer research setting or in an archival uh, internship in partnership with a faculty mentor. Thinking about problem solving, not just as problems, but as project management is a little cartwheel that students can make to help articulate their intellectual work as having applicability in consulting contexts. 
Consulting firms value evidence of facility with qualitative and quantitative data. What they don't need for you to have is, you know, uh, high level mastery of and wizard level skills in Python and R. Uh, does it help if you know what Python and R are and you're like really good at Excel? Sure, absolutely. Do you need to have those skills when you are starting to think about applying to consulting uh, roles? No. And I think it's also important to know that the kind of math that you typically need to be successful when interviewing in the case interview context or even when starting in positions at the internship and full time level is no more than what you can do in the back of a napkin or if you're actually allowed to do kind of like, you know, tabulations with a calculator. There's nothing more complicated than that. Consulting firms do value a humanist's capacity to use qualitative evidence to make a strong case. They do value a social scientist's facility with ethnographic and quantitative uh, measures of uh, quantitative data, of qualitative data. It's not just that you have to be a quantitative person. It's that you need to show you have some basic facility with math to help tell qualitative stories. I think consulting firms value evidence of curiosity and intellectual fl flexibility. You have some general ideas about how to ask good questions about a range of industries. You do not need to know how manufacturing works, how pipelines for raw materials from Southeast Asia make it to the United States in the fashion industry. You don't need to get inside tech uh, infrastructure. You don't need to know how to build an app. You don't need to know how people make money in tourism. And you certainly don't need to know the difference between a 737 and an A320. Though I do, it's only because I'm a super nerd. It's not because I'm a consultant. What you need to show is that you are intellectually curious and flexible enough to get trained quickly on the knowledge that's necessary for performing mastery for a client. You will be moving in lots of different industry, industrial contexts in consulting. So your capacity to get up to speed on what's necessary to know in the pharmaceutical industry versus the transportation industry is a sign of your capacity to do the work well. You got to show that you're a team player. You don't have to show that you already have a startup and you have 10 employees under you. So team contexts at Barnard can be in student organizations. You all lead meetings more effectively than any group of students I've ever seen before. Uh, you know how to run groups. You know how to get things done. So thinking about collaboration and teamwork in classroom and student organization contexts, and of course internships as well is important. Showing that you have already founded a business is not necessary. These last two, you have to have adeptness at presenting, uh, maybe in a cardigan with a nice like bottle of water on a nice afternoon. Uh, you do not need to have a, a TED talk with huge followers. You thankfully don't have to be an Instagram influencer, at least not yet to get a job uh, in consulting. What you need to do is project confidence in your ability to convey information. And that comes with practice, practice with me and with staff and your behavioral interviews, practice in cases with each other. Uh, but it comes from, and, and you have to think about why. It's because consultants need to know that you are ready to be in front of potentially C-suite level individuals in the context of client engagements from day one at the firm. Your ability to convey confidence in an interview setting gives them confidence that you can be in front of a client as soon as possible once you're hired. And the last thing is you need networking savvy. We talked yesterday a little bit about, uh, I appreciated the question from someone identifying themselves privately as an, uh, as an introvert. You don't need to be like me, like my fellow capital E extroverts uh, to be a consultant. What you do need to know is how to move around communities, how to build consensus, how to connect with individuals who can help you get your work done. And you don't need a cousin at the partner level, which is to say you don't need pre-existing family connections in order to get the referrals that are helpful in landing a role. You all as Barnard students have all of the social capital necessary to connect with individuals who can be helpful to you in the recruiting process. Um, the last one here, I just kind of, you have to show interest in their firm. I'll talk a little bit about that in the cover letter stage here. You have to be able to communicate that you know something specific about each firm that you apply to. 
Another way of thinking about this before we get into job documents specifically, and this is how I'll approach, I'll approach the challenge of actually translating your experience into the job documents, is to treat your task of writing those documents like a consultant treats their work. So recall yesterday, for those of you who listened in, in the most general sense, consultants address a challenge, analyze potential root causes, present recommended courses of action, and sometimes implement solutions. How does this map onto your challenge as a candidate? Well, I think your strategic challenge is actually a communications one. It's to articulate a strong narrative about how you are a fit to a particular firm. How are you gonna make that argument? Well, you need to analyze your experience. You are using yourself as a locus of evidence to make a strong claim to communicate your fitness to the firm. You're gonna present those recommendations uh, in a manner that aligns with the task at hand. So you're gonna make your case in terminology that's recognizable to consulting firms. You're gonna present, presenting effectively here is essentially using the terms that are provided to you in the process of applying. The job description, let's say, for example. And sometimes, okay, you're going to interview. Uh, I like to think about this as like the optional implementation part of consulting work. You won't always implement in the same way that you won't always interview. But it's important to recognize that your job documents are not the ticket to the job. They're a ticket to the interview. Your resume and cover letter don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be comprehensive because they are not going to help you get the job itself. They will help you get in the door. How are we doing so far? Mostly okay. Okay, great. I didn't freeze there. I was trying to, yeah. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate you coming on for one second to give the thumbs up. Um, okay, resumes. Here we go. Number one thing. Uh, that's actually a twofer right at the top. Attention to detail cannot be, uh, you cannot find a substitute for it. So I'm making one point kind of uh, orthogonally here. Don't use Comic Sans on your resume. That's the, the single worst font in the history of humankind. Uh, and make sure that you are checking your resume three times for uh, proofreading mistakes, copy edit errors. You can't recover from having two E's in education at the very top of your document. Um, so make sure that you are assiduously getting a second and third set of eyes to correct for content and copy. Um, I'm using this anonymized resume here for Diana Consultant. Uh, this is a resume of an individual who got a job at a top firm uh, at Accenture within the last couple of years. I don't want to say too much without giving away who the person is. Um, I made one addendum here. I added a fake experience at the Universidad de Sevilla, not only because I like saying that, but because uh, I want to talk a little bit about how study abroad and other education experiences can be helpful to have in your top section. Um, but this is a re otherwise a real uh, resume that got a final round and then ultimately an offer at Accenture. First thing to say here is to go uh, is to, is to talk about how we read, at least how we read in English. We read down the page and from left to right, meaning the most important information in the document overall is at the top. It also tends to be over to the left-hand side of the page. Less in important information is further down as a rule, I'll talk about exceptions, and also over to the right, again, as a rule. So just thinking about the way that space works is important. The resume at the left is of standard format. This is how I will advise you to do your resume, really no matter what kind of field you're applying to. It's a basic starting point. It does not distract with bells and whistles or colors. I see a lot of this in recommended templates, especially on consulting advising sites. I see check marks, like different bubbles that are filled in to specify skill levels. All of that distracts. Your content should speak for itself. And the cleaner the format, I argue, the stronger. And again, like I said yesterday, none of this is dogmatic. None of this is religion. But I do want to suggest that the simpler the format, the better. You should be using a legible font. The font at left is Railway, a great Google Docs font. I like it a lot. It's a sans serif font. I also like using Google Docs because your even if your computer crashes, you won't lose the work that you're doing. Cloud-based uh, documents are my favorite thing. I no longer lose things like term papers, which used to happen to me in college all the time because I was an idiot. Um, 
but you want to use fonts that may not, may be a little bit different from the standard. So Times New Roman, Arial, and Calibri, I call these the sweatpants of fonts. Um, I know we're all in our sweatpants. I'm actually wearing denim today, you can't see, but I actually do not have sweatpants on. Uh, you wouldn't leave your house in sweatpants, I always say. Um, so why put your resume in the sweatpants of fonts? You wanna be legible, clean, but slightly visually distinctive from everybody else. Go easy on the reader's eyes. I see far too many consulting resumes in like nine point font. You wanna keep it to 11 to 12 point. This is not for any kind of like hard and fast rule. I just think it's really important to show the reader that you can be efficient. In both your resume and your cover letter, you are essentially modeling the type of arguer and curator of information that you are and will be as a consultant. A good consultant can make their argument really succinctly and efficiently. A good consultant is not going to give a document to a client that they can hardly read for all of the text, the forest of font that is on the single page. That said, you do wanna keep it to one page. You don't wanna go over to two. I know that consulting firms now have relaxed the standards so that you can go on to two pages if you want. I still make the case that because of that efficiency criterion that I just articulated, it's better to keep it to one page. It shows that you can make a strong argument efficiently. I'm a curmudgeon when it comes to two line bullets. Um, you'll see on this resume, I've softened in my old age. Uh, there are some two line bullets on the bullet points on this resume, but I really think that you should keep it to, to, to one wherever possible. Like I said, you should think about um, horizontal, how people go down the page. Um, and we'll talk about how to write strong active bullets in a moment, but really I wanna underline here, you should quantify wherever possible. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you need to say like, how many students you tutored? Sure. How often you taught? Sure. Um, the total number of Instagram followers that grew under your watch as the social media director for WKCR. Yes, perfect. Does it matter that the numbers are small? No, if, and that's if the numbers are small. What matters is that you are showing that you care about quantitative measures, that you care and can give the reader a sense of scale of impact that you, that you occasioned in your role. Make sense? It's kind of a long way of saying it. Quantify wherever possible. Okay, attention to detail. Let's drill into this resume. Let's look at the way that I'm trying to suggest orienting the information. First, simple heading. I don't need to see a five line heading that wastes valuable space on the page. I think your heading should be two lines, a slightly larger name in bold. I always say it should be bigger, but we shouldn't have to be able to see it from space. If you're using an 11 point font, your name can be 13. Everything else should be on one line. What I like here is this person added their LinkedIn, uh, their personal LinkedIn link as well. I think that's a good thing. Your LinkedIn profile can work in complement with the rest of your resume. I think lead with Barnard College of Columbia University, Barnard College, comma, Columbia University, however you want to put it. It is your strongest uh, education credential right now, and you should be proud of it right at the top. You should write align your dates. Now I'm gonna take a pause here in sharing the presentation and instead do something that is, for those of you who've seen me do it before, probably old hat. For those of you who haven't seen me before, I hope it counts as somewhere between like a magic trick and just like a huge time saver. So what I'm going to do is share my screen slightly differently and Give me one moment. Okay, so what I see very often in resumes, here's a Microsoft Word. I see, let's say January 2020 through present. I see an awful lot of resumes. Students are doing this, tap, 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 space, 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 oh God, right? I don't want you to lose your mind anymore, okay? I want you to do things the efficient way. If you have a Mac, Go up here to the top left and click until you see this left facing arrow. You're gonna use that in the ruler. You're gonna click in the ruler and now you have what's called a left hand, I'm oh, sorry, right hand tab stop. You're gonna drag that to the end of the page and hit tab only once. And now the text will move this way. 
And what's even better is if you change the size of your font up or down, it stays pinned to the side of the page. All right, so right align your dates doing that. You'll, I don't want anybody to lose their minds trying to figure out how to right align. <laughs> Helen, thank you. The applause are always appreciated. I have many magic tricks. Unfortunately, they are all related to Microsoft Word. Um, okay, so back to the presentation. Right align your dates. Um, the next is to use study abroad and other educational experiences to help advance a different part of your candidacy. So I like having, uh, some people ask me, should I have study abroad? I think yes, it's a great chance for you to showcase some of your language abilities. If you did a summer course in coding, put it up there in education, show where you developed a particular skill that's going to be helpful. Use your other educational uh, endeavors to help fill out your application or fill out your, your profile. And a word on GPA, I think as long as your GPA is above the minimum criterion, you should put it. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a 3.5 and you have a 3.501. Uh, if your GPA is above the minimum criterion, it counts. Put it on there. If it's not meeting the minimum criterion, I actually don't even argue that you shouldn't apply. I think consulting firms more than ever are considering holistic review. And even if on paper you don't necessarily meet that criterion, you can still apply and make an argument as to why the other experiences that you have still make you a strong candidate. All right, further down the page, making a clear argument. First of all, using headings that work for you. So I see too many uh, resumes that say education, professional experience, extracurriculars. That doesn't tell me anything about what's in those individual uh, sections. I like this heading, financial services and market analysis experience, because the position that this individual is applying to was for a financial consulting position at, the, at Accenture. So what she's doing with this heading is saying, hey, the experience that you are looking for is in this section. Calling the reader's attention by virtue of the title of the heading can help structure the way they then think about what's in everything that's under that heading. And like I said, mostly one line bullets that follow. I'm gonna dig into bullets, I think, uh, in just a second. So I'm not gonna dig in here, but keeping things organized using headings that make it clear what's in each section. So for example, instead of involvement or extracurriculars, I like leadership and community engagement. These kind of active, engaged, um, you know, roles where you're managing folks, where you're taking ownership, these are important facets that consultants want to see. All right, when it comes to skills, languages, and interests at the bottom, I actually think consulting firms really do quite often like the interests section. I always joke about the McKinsey candidate who turns out to be like a black belt in jujitsu or like a you know, a three-star Michelin chef. Um, if your experiences and interest, if your interests are distinctive or credentialed, so here um, this candidate uh, was really involved in documentary filmmaking and interested in carceral justice for young people, really common among Barnard to be engaged in social justice causes, um, but that's distinctive. Um, it's not like travel. Like, do you like travel and food? I once saw on this blog about resumes, like, great, we all do. Right? Do you like France? Okay, awesome. I am hate watching Emily in Paris right now too. But like that doesn't make you, uh, come on, I can't be the only one. I mean, Gina is in the next room. She was really the one watching it last night. I was just doing this presentation, but it was definitely on our television last night. Um, so those interests should be distinctive. They help call, call you out. And I think consulting firms like to see interests because they like to have these dynamic and um, kind of quirky people on their staffs. Technical skills are really highly valued. If you have certifications, if you've completed a Khan Academy class, if you've done an empirical reasoning center course at Barnard on Excel, you should put that. Put not only your skill, but what language, what level of proficiency you have with it and how you developed that level of proficiency. I think languages are always strong too. Consulting firms are often international in nature. For those of you who may be F1 students thinking about sponsorship, two things to say here. One, consulting firms, especially the large ones, are really adept at getting international students into their pipelines. 
But two, just be cognizant that when you put native X speaker, it may plant in the recruiter's mind that this is a person who may require sponsorship. Um, so I typically like to say fluent no matter what, um, or if, you know, or heritage, if you have uh, speakers at home, those are slightly different fluent and heritage are different designations. I'm always happy to answer questions about this, um, you know, privately if you wanna, basically what I'm saying is, you are not obligated to put anything about your country of origin or your citizen status, citizenship status on your resume. And sometimes putting native X will do that, uh, will we'll introduce doubt. You also don't have to put fluent English. You all go to Barnard, it is assumed. I see a lot of that. Um, do keep in mind when you list languages, uh, conversational Spanish, I know a lot of us have that on there, um, but how conversational is conversational? Do you, for example, feel comfortable conducting an interview in Spanish? If not, I would suggest not putting conversational uh, in uh, next to any language where you do not feel comfortable actually conducting a conversation. I know conversational sometimes you just like, I'm kind of able in this language. In an interview setting, you just don't want to take the risk. Um, okay, next. All right, when it comes to writing a strong bullet point, I think that really resumes in general, but consulting firms, I think especially, value these different kinds of buckets of verbs. Verbs that convey leadership experience, your capacity to analyze quantitative and qualitative data, your experience in teams, leading teams, participating in teams, collaborating, your ability to present and communicate complex information, and most importantly, I think, being results-oriented. What did your effort result in? What effort did, sorry, what output came from your input? Um, that's a really, like being quote-unquote results-oriented is really important on consulting resumes. So I see a lot of job description resumes, resumes where students will tell me the things that they were required to do, like supported administrative or provided administrative support. Okay, fine, that's something you did in your work, but what did your administrative support result in? So I would say drove 10% efficiency by revising administrative processes. So the, the focus in a consulting resume is on the result of your input. I think that's a little more important in consulting work than let's say not nonprofit work, for example. Weaker words, assisted, worked on, learned, understood, did. Notice these are general words. They don't give me specificity when it comes to what I was actually accomplishing or doing in the, the course of my experience. So I think in general, these are strong, good words to begin with. How do you actually put these together? Well, I think your action, which is that strong verb, combined with some sort of quantity and then uh, an outcome. So for example, you can really do this with anything. Let's say you tutored weekly, you tutored up in Morningside Heights. So you could say something like, um, supported four students in passing New York City Regents tests uh, in weekly tutoring engagements, right? So that is a strong consulting bullet point that has nothing to do with consulting, right? I'm teaching, but what I'm doing also there is, let's say I'm a, a great consulting bullet point for teaching is translated complex concepts to, uh, complex physics concepts to 10 middle, <laughs> you're not doing middle school physics, to 10 11th graders uh, at uh, under-resourced school in Harlem. Right? So who are you reaching? What kind of communications are you doing? Like a kind of, teaching is a kind of communications that breaks down complex concepts for beginner audiences. That is precisely what you're doing with complex consulting problems for clients. You're taking really complicated ideas, breaking them into their constitutive parts, and presenting potential solutions. So I think this is kind of like a very simple three-part Mad Lib to writing strong bullet points. You might think of it as um, you know, just what you did, how much of it you did, and what came of it. Keep focused on your outcomes and your productivity. You can say that you were a member of a team, but make sure that you're emphasizing what your role 
is on that team. This is perfect. For once I'm like perfectly on time. It, it feels weird. I feel like I should just like take a swig of water and like take a walk around the apartment. I'm not actually gonna walk around the apartment. Okay, that, that does it for resumes for me. Um, we're gonna transition to cover letter best practices. And I'm gonna lay out, again, I'm gonna lay out this um, kind of list here. This actually looks like, y'all, so when I first did this presentation, um, this was just like a stock image, but check this out. My dad got this for me for my 35th birthday. He got this typewriter rebuilt for me. So my brother-in-law got it at like, um, like an estate auction for $10. He brings this like 40 pound hunk of metal and it's like this really great metaphor for me and my brother-in-law's relationship. It's like, here's this giant thing that I don't know what you're gonna do anything with. And I'm just like, oh Jesus Christ. And then my dad got a bill. For, anyway, that's the, it looks a lot like that typewriter. Um, okay, so what is a cover letter? To me, a cover letter is the connective tissue for your resume. That is, if the resume is the bones of your experience, the skeleton, the kind of, architecture of your general experience, the cover letter helps fit that tissue together or helps fit those bones together. It connects through your prose the little bones of your experience, okay? So you're not merely restating what the resume does. Instead, you're going to pick a couple of compelling examples that show how the experience that you've got on your resume met the road. The rubber of your experience met the road. In doing so, fit is the key word. And again and again and again, for consulting firms, your capacity to describe exactly why you are driven and excited by the particular firm that you're applying to is really important. Understanding their culture, their mission, talking to some of the people uh, that are at the firm, all that is important to convey in a cover letter. When it comes to the meta stuff that you're doing in a cover letter, I think you're really making an argument that you should treat like a client-facing memo. So you are performing the task of a consultant in writing efficiently for someone who's trying to make a determination about the strength of your, of your case. Um, essentially, it's a writing sample. It's not just a list, right? The, the list is your resume. What the cover letter evaluates is your capacity to be a good writer to leverage those strong Barnard writing roots, to go all the way back to first year seminar and make a strong case that's well-structured using evidence from your own experience. Um, okay, so this, this reference gets older and older and I'm just, I'm reticent to, to scrap it because I love it so much and I've used it for so long, but obey the destiny's child rule. The destiny's child rule is to say their name, say their name, say their name. Uh, make sure that you always bring it back to the firm name. Um, always literally say the name of the firm. To BCG, I would bring this. At OCNC as an associate consultant, I would be ready to why. Make sure that you are actually engaging the people who are reading this thing at the firm where you are applying. That will show confidence. That will show that you have tailored to each firm that will show that you cared enough to do your homework and evaluate what examples are strongest for each particular place that you're applying to. Last part, humanize it, sign it, download an app. You guys have styluses, you also have fingers and you have tablets and smartphones. Write a little signature and paste a little image of it into the cover letter. It is the smallest way to humanize what is otherwise very often a dehumanizing process and it just makes your materials look a little more professional. So here are the, here's the rules of the genre when we're looking at the first paragraph and the heading. First of all, don't waste a ton of time with the heading. I see like eight lines of addresses. You don't need that. I don't even think you need the, the in-person address anymore at all, it's up to you. Um, I like to put via email if you're sending it via email, but honestly, even that you can scrap. I do think the date is still important and you should address it to a real person where possible. So if you have a recruiting contact, address it to dear that person's full name. We are operating in a moment of heightened awareness. It's all a good thing uh, about pronouns. And I do not anymore think it's appropriate to write dear sir or madam. I do not think it is appropriate unless you are specifically told to write dear Ms. X. Um, if there's a PhD after someone's name, certainly you can say doctor, that's always good. But I think dear first name, last name 
is formal, professional, and appropriate. This first paragraph does not need to break all of the conventions. You do not need to lead with a really exciting anecdote. I was hanging by my fingers over a cliff when I realized, ah, oh, I wanted to work at Ingenuity Consulting. No, you, you are writing a professional letter. You're writing to apply to a particular role. I don't think you should bury the lead that you are at Barnard. Don't assume that they're going to eventually find out you went to Barnard because they're definitely going to read your resume. I think lead with Barnard. Say it right up front who you are and what kind of degree you're graduating with. I like this comparative literature and chemistry, which I totally made up, but to me is like hashtag Barnard.com. Um, I like the third sentence to be what attracts you to the firm. Why are you excited about ingenuity consulting as opposed to other, uh, other firms? What campus visits did you attend? Uh, what information sessions did you go to? And uh, alumni like Bonnie Barnard, who have you spent time talking to in the lead up to applying? It's totally appropriate to mention some of these things right at the top. And then finally, this, like, this kind of final paragraph, if you think about cover letters as argumentative essays, then the final sentence is your thesis. It's your main claim. And I think here it's important to use the language of contribution. So very often I see first drafts from Barnard students about, I would, you know, consulting ingenuity is great because it will give me the opportunity to learn about the tech business. Yeah, but they're not trying to give you a job out of charity. They're not concerned. They don't want to hire you because they're like, oh, Jackie's really interested in learning. I'm sure she'll be a great consultant. No, they want to know what you are going to bring, right? You are supposed to bring something to the firm and they want to know that you have thought about how what you have to contribute will add value to the firm and to clients. So that's the first paragraph. Second paragraph, I, second and third paragraph, I think there should be two body paragraphs, two consulting uh, cover letters. I see an increasing, I don't know, kind of goes back and forth. Like some people like to use bullet points to ar articulate their key points in the cover letter. I'm not a fan of that. Bullet points I think are still for resumes. Like I say, I think cover letters are a place for you to demonstrate that you are a strong writer. It's up to you, it's a matter of personal preference. You're gonna get my spiel in what these paragraphs look like now. Here's these sentences basically, here's these paragraphs basically mapped out. It be, each paragraph begins with a point sentence. So for those of you who took fifth grade language arts, you wanna think all the way back to those heady times when you were 10, and your problems were bigger than anybody else's in the world if you're anything like, like I was. I was a moody kid. Uh, your point sentence, your topic sentence should foreground for the audience what is going to be discussed in that paragraph. If I have 30 seconds to read your cover letter, and I might if I'm a recruiter at a busy consulting firm, I should be able to read just your thesis statement and the first sentence of your two body paragraphs and have a very clear sense of why you are a good fit to the firm. Remember you're arguing for structure, I'm sorry, you're arguing based on your, the strength of your experiences and the fitness of your experiences to the firm, but you're also then showing something about your capacity to structure an argument. And consulting is all about frameworks and structured thinking and organization. So it is important for your cover letters to be almost overdetermined in the way that they are built. Then notice in each of these body paragraphs, instead of going to everything that I have accomplished in each of these paragraphs, I'm using one, maybe two examples of my leadership, of productivity that I demonstrated in a couple of different scenarios. So I'm not saying everything that I did, I'm basically making a couple of choices about specific instances where my capacity as a leader, a manager, a thinker, an analyzer, communicator produced something. And then finally, in these uh, kind of red and I think green boxes here, I'm uh, mobilizing Destiny's Child rule. I'm saying their name. Given Ingenuity's emphasis on the importance of a hypothesis-driven consulting model that can be shared with non-experts, I would be eager to redeploy the skills that I have developed in a hybrid research and communications environment. So I know something about Ingenuity's culture. 
And given what I know, I would be excited to contribute this. So your final sentence there is an example of an opportunity to say, okay, I've done my homework. I know what hypothesis driven consulting approaches are. And given that I know what that is, and I know that I have the experience, here's how I would redeploy the skills that I've got. Okay, finally here, and you know, so it's basically intro paragraph overstructured with a thesis. Two body paragraphs that lay out very specific examples uh, that begin with a point sentence that lay out specific examples of how your work is applicable to the work of the firm and that end with a destiny's child, say their name, here's how I'm going to contribute at the firm I'm applying to. I think the final paragraph is where you basically convey confidence and end professionally. So I see too much, I hope to do case interviews with you, or it would be an honor to work at Ingenuity Consulting. It's not gonna be an honor, it's just gonna be a job. It might be really exciting once in a while, um, but hope and praying and uh, honor, the, the, these, these words don't have a place in cover letters for business, uh, for, for business roles, okay? You would enjoy the opportunity to discuss uh, the role at Ingenuity. Uh, that's all you're going to do. That's all your cover letter is going to do. It's going to be a ticket to a discussion. Convey your gratitude for consideration. And here, it's not, I hope and pray that we will talk together one day soon. It's, I look forward to talking soon, or I would look forward to talking soon. That's a way to convey, hey, this is my stuff. I gave you who I am on paper. It would be great to talk some more. Then you assign it. Um, I was really proud of that paw print when I first put this creative little thing together a couple of years ago. But sign it, personalize it, you know, <laughs> thanks. Every time I see like a, you know, a cartoon emoji is proof that y'all are still out there, which I also approve of and am grateful for. Um, sign it and that's it. You're humanizing this piece of correspondence that's being sent to what is very often a dehumanizing feeling bucket, right? You're emailing recruiting at ingenuity.info or whatever. Sign this document, put your human touch on it. That's how you finish off a cover letter. So I would say for your, oh God, my computer's gonna die. I should be using a typewriter. Um, plugged in. My assignment to you would be try to do this. Um, I wanna be honest with you all and say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this theme throughout the entire week. Consulting is not for everyone. It may be for you, it may not be. I would say that if you're thinking about roles that are out there and writing these cover letters is exciting to you, if you can genuinely come up with reasons why you're looking forward to the prospect of working at a particular firm, it's possible that this might really be a good fit. Writing cover letters once you get a hang of the genre is a really good way to test your fitness and your enthusiasm for a particular firm. So I'd encourage you, even if you're not yet actually applying for roles, try to write one of these things and see if it works out. See if you're excited throughout the process about the work that you could be uh, potentially doing at the firm that has listed the opportunity. Questions, we started at 5.04. Um, I didn't check the chat, I saw there were two questions hanging out there. The font that I used in the example resume, which I will also send to you all, is Railway. Uh, it is, I'm very excited, I'm a big fan of Railway. I'm also a big fan of Garamond. Uh, Garamond is one of my faves. Um, what descriptions do you advise students for in a position anticipating an outcome that have not? I'm not sure that I understand one of these questions. I'm going to um, respond to that person. Sorry. Um, I, and look, I, people are digging into the font thing. You can use Times New Roman if you want. I just have a personal thing against them. I think it's important to, um, you know, be a little bit visually distinctive. Um, you're not going to get a uh, shot out into the atmosphere if you submit a resume in Times New Roman. Garamond is a little smaller while not appearing to be that small. So it's, it's, it's helpful to be a little bit, uh, it gives you a little bit more space. Um, I'm not a big fan of TNR. I don't think I've suggested anyone use it, but it's up to you guys. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, what other questions do you all have, if any?
All right. I'm going to end it there. That was like eight seconds of silence. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to loop back around. We're going to talk about strategies for reaching out to uh, alumni to do informational interviews. We're going to talk a little bit about coffee chats, which are essentially just informational interviews in a consulting specific context. Um, and we'll talk about be some strategies for approaching behavioral interview questions. And by that, I mean questions like, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Tell me about a time that you achieved something on a team. Tell me about a time that you had a conflict with someone in the workplace. Um, so we'll talk about those things tomorrow and lead up to the case uh, conversation on Thursday. I'll follow up with the recording this evening. Um, and that's that. Have a nice evening, everybody. I hope it's a good week. We are three weeks out from the election. Steal yourselves, continue to do so, hold on to each other, um, and hopefully y'all are doing okay as we head into fall A finals. I'll talk to y'all soon. Have a good evening. Thank you. Hey, what happened? Thank you. Bye.